Senator Talmadge, Congressman Callaway, we deeply appreciate your sharing the personal remarks about Judge Bell. And as a follow-up to your personal remarks, we've prepared a short video. <laughs> Mary just said, oh no. And what we would like to do now is through the video is give you a glimpse of Judge Bell. And I think you will find it extremely interesting, informative, and those of you who are facing need to turn around. The video screen is to my right, back in the corner, and you will see Judge Bell in a different light. Well, if you grew up in a rural area of South Georgia, uh, one of the principal uh, topics of conversation is public service. And when I was younger, I had an aspiration to run for office, but I never got around to it, and I always ended up doing other things, being in politics, but not as a, uh, somebody running for elected office. So I'm, all my life, I've had an interest in, in the political system. From the time I was a small boy, I was, uh, wanted to be a lawyer because my father talked to me a lot about it, took me to the courthouse and left me up there to watch these arguments. Well, I had to wear some military career of anybody. I, I spent four years worrying because I wasn't overseas. One time I even had Congressman Pace trying to get me overseas and uh, he finally wrote me a letter. He either called me and said that uh, if he said any, anything more to the Defense Department, they were going to send me to Alaska. <laughs> so he said, you about worn your welcome out on this transferring. We met during the war right next door to to where I lived at the time at a party. Within the year we were married, which was 52 years ago. We're exact opposites, as you can tell. Having him in my life has been good for me. He is the person who goes out of his way to stay in touch with us. Uh, he's the person that makes the effort to do so many things. I remember in in high school that when I played football here in Atlanta, no matter where he was and as busy as he was, he would always make sure that he got home for those Friday night football games. And not only that, after the game, and I'd go out with the girlfriend or the boys or whatever, that he would wait up for me and I'd get home about midnight or 12.30 and we would talk over the game at the end of the day. Dad and I have had a lot of spirited discussions, debates, arguments, et cetera, through the years, but it doesn't bother us. We have stimulating conversations at the table that I learned from him, whereas a, a, a newcomer sitting at the table would probably be horrified. It's pretty intimidating. Or put off by. You usually just sit there and wait for a second that you might be able to say one thing, and you plan it and try to make it as short as possible because you know that you'll be cut off very quickly. He won't get to finish a paragraph, maybe not even a sentence. He's always considered himself a real authority on the Constitution. He made the top grades on that in law school. He passed the bar after five quarters, which is quite an accomplishment. He was probably the most qualified person who ever became the Attorney General of the United States. He was chosen to be the campaign manager for Kennedy in the state of Georgia. And then in addition to that, all that, he was a federal judge for 14 years. And a federal judge not doing mundane things, but in the most, probably the, one of the most important times in our American history, and that is the civil rights era in the South. He's a great believer of people and getting together and working out their differences. He's a great person to get them together and mediate. He would literally use the chambers of the federal judge in a particular town, bring the parties together in the suit, the, say the school superintendent and the school board, he'd, have, he'd sit them down and say, all right, Mr. Marshall, I want you to go to the front door. I want you to lock it. I want you to stand by the door. And you're not to let anybody out of this room until these parties have resolved their differences. And then he'd sit down and say, now, don't you think we ought to get started? <laughs> <laughs> Good. And people have, would have trouble even looking back at it today and deciding 
whether that was, for example, a liberal thing that he did or a conservative thing that he did. And I think it was really in his mind neither. It was a practical approach uh, to avoid a very hard situation. He was appointed chairman of the Atlanta Crime Commission, and he got the job done well under budget and got it done in like eight or nine months. I have selected, and the Senate has now confirmed, a man who will not just be an adequate attorney general, but who will be a great attorney general. I noticed in my engineering computations that he got 78% of the votes in the Senate. Uh, I only got a little over 50% as president. <laughs> people had lost respect for the Department of Justice. And indeed, people were referring to it in the 70s as a Department of Injustice. Bell, a 58-year-old Atlanta lawyer, former federal judge, and longtime friend of Mr. Carter, becomes the nation's 72nd Attorney General. Mr. Carter ordered the doors at the main entrance of the department to be reopened for the first time since the Vietnam demonstrations in 1970. We think this is a symbolic uh, gesture of uh, the way we're going to operate the Justice Department. Open door policy, and we're coming out from behind the barricades. We don't need to be behind locked doors. We were planning to be there two years, if I recall, that the judge told the president. Uh, but uh, it ended up almost three years. And I think he thoroughly enjoyed every minute he was there. He really did. He became managing partner of this law firm in the 1950s at a very early age. He left to go on the federal bench in 1961. And uh, then he came back in 76 for less than a year and once again began to play an important role in the firm and uh, then became attorney general. Everyone was glad to see him come back in 79 and uh, he then became very actively involved once again in the management of the law firm and uh, served at various times as uh, chairman of the uh, management uh, committee. Judge Bell's motto was uh, follow, follow or get out of the firm. He was very authoritative, and uh, you know his way was the right way. You know, Griffin is a very fair person. People just can't help but like him and uh, respect him, uh, even when they uh, strongly disagree with him on occasions. And I've been with him on occasions when other lawyers would uh, really take strong disagreement with what he said, but they would always walk out as friends. I don't have a mean streak in me. I never hate anybody. I've got that. My father was like that. Uh, he, he would always try to help somebody. I think I got it maybe from him, so I don't ever try to hate anybody. And if, even if you have to make a hard decision against someone uh, on, on an employment basis or something like that, I always try to do it in a, in a way where you preserve your dignity. Judge Bell's greatest strengths are his just native intelligence, his common sense, his extraordinary energy. At, uh, at 76 years old, he can outwork and outthink just about any lawyer in our firm. He's often seen in a coat and tie, and I've always thought that he only had about three outfits. One was a, the uh, coat and tie, of course, his hunting outfit and his golfing outfit. Hunting and golf. And golf. And he uh, really gets a great amount of enjoyment out of that. And it's a great way to be with friends. It, 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 uh, it's the only time he really gets to be with them, off, off with the boys, so to speak, I call it. Well, I did want you to include Missy on this because uh, she and the judge are very close. They, uh, from the day she was delivered to us, they, they bonded. and. Uh, the most fun they have together is the judge will take her to the farm and they will roam the fields in the woods for the whole day and once in a while they'll run into a covey and Missy will retrieve for them. Missy and, and Granddad have each have a bowl of cereal together every morning. That's where his soft spot is when it comes to his dog. <laughs> As a golfer last year in a contest, he played 80 holes in one day. He was the leader of this charitable endeavor in which I guess more money was raised the more holes of golf you play. He played 80 holes and put all these younger people to he bed. Did. Literally, they couldn't go to work. They could not keep day. up with him. Excitement and uh, 
interest is around, always around Griffith. He breeds that. Uh, we're going to do our, our very best to see that he never retires. My dad places a great premium on character and integrity. He takes sort of a common sense path to what is usually a very good solution. You know, he really did work very, very hard for where he got. But even as he's gotten older, and he's now 76, uh, he continues to see visions like a young man. The man would have made a great musician. It's, it's a real shame. I can't think of anything better than to be like granddad. I am very strong on public safety. I have an idea that, that our country will not be saved well if all the able people just devote their time to making money. So everyone ought to be thinking when they're young about doing public service. And I would give them the advice that they ought to face the hard questions. Politics is an honorable profession. What's wrong with Washington is that every congressman that's ever saved, or anybody that's saved in a high office like Attorney General, particularly if they're from a state with bad climate, they never leave. So I've always thought that we ought to have term limits. And if they haven't rendered their service in 12 years, it's unlikely that they're going to render any great service. The president ought to be say, six, eight, six years, no more than that, and not run for re-election. He would then divorce his political party from the White House, which, which is needed. And we can't play games any longer. We're not, we don't have that luxury anymore in this country. We're just talking about balancing the budget. We haven't got to the hard problem of paying the debt. President Roosevelt was a good, a good man. The things he did, most of them, were to get us out of the Depression. And the people that want to do keep doing the same thing uh, have not adjusted to the time. We've been out of the Depression a long time. Our government was going out of control. The fact that we want to balance the budget is a, sick, a sign of sickness. But we have got to do something about uh, balancing the budget, uh, reducing the debt, eventually paying it off. Uh, we got to simplify our uh, bureaucracies. Um, we got to uh, control the money. We got a very fine system of government, and we got the checks and balances, and it gets a little bit out of whack, but it sort of, sort of comes back together. I mean, we've got a great country. Senator Talmadge introduced me one time when I was a attorney general down here in Georgia somewhere, and he had a you know, he's got a sort of a caustic wit. And he said that he's proud to know me and, and uh, that he and I were unique uh, in Washington, that neither one of us was ever spending any time in a state or federal penitentiary. <laughs> Barbara and I wish we could be with you to pay tribute to our esteemed friend, an outstanding Georgian, Judge Griffin Bell. When I think about Griffin Bell, I think about a man who has served his country with integrity, with decency, with honor, always with honor. Moreover, through his many contributions to his community, he's been what I call a point of light, helping to lift the lives of others, giving something back. Griff, we are very proud of you, proud to call you and marry our friends, and we are prouder still to join in saluting you as you receive the prestigious 1995 Georgia Freedom Award. Congratulations. Well done, my friend.